Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council uh, meeting of, of uh, March March 17th, uh, 16th, 2017. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight, and uh, I will be presiding. Um, as our usual custom allows, we before we convene and councilors, <coughs> excuse me, uh, before we convene, we invite the public to speak. Um, uh, with some parameters, if you can keep your comments to three minutes, please. Normally there's a timer right behind me, but it's gone. So there'll be one there on that screen. Uh, we ask that you step up, state your name and address, uh, and then you can speak on any topic. It doesn't have to be written on the agenda. Oh, we have nobody signed up, okay. Um, <laughs> Well, for future reference, if anyone's interested, this is how we do it. We ask that you comport with the decorum of the chambers and um, refrain from cussing and, uh, and then also defaming any individual who's not a public figure. And um, that's essentially it. Also understanding, knowing that the council, that because it's a public comment period, the council does not speak. We do not speak. This is your turn to speak. So. We don't do give and take and questions and back and forth during that time. That said, we have two folks here tonight. Either of you want to speak? I'm racking my brain. I got nothing. All right. Okay. That's okay. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> All right. So, in the absence of anyone uh, willing to step up and speak tonight, I'm going to ask the administrative assistant to please call the roll. Councilor Bidwell. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. Councilor Shera. Here. <coughs> All right. We have a quorum. Um, <coughs> so we start off with an announcement of a public hearing. This is the public hearing that will be held during the City Council meeting, uh, City Council Committee on Finance, uh, the meeting concerning the Northampton Capital Improvement Program for FY 2018 to FY 22. And that's submitted by Mayor Narkowitz on February 28, 2017. And this is in accordance with the Charter of Northampton, Massachusetts, Article 7, Finance and Fiscal Procedures, Section 7 5, Capital Improvement Program. It's a requirement, uh, subsection B, public hearing. And so, by order of the City Council, public hearing to be held on Tuesday, March 28, 2017, at 7 p.m. <coughs> here in City Council Chambers located in the Wallace J. Pluchowski Municipal Building at 212 Main Street, Northampton, Massachusetts. The City Council will consider the Capital Improvement Program for FY 2018 FY to FY 22 and hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. Um, any one-minute announcements from Councilors? Councilor Klein. Um, on March 29th is the 17th annual, <coughs> excuse me, Northampton Adult Spelling Bee an annual event, uh, 17th annual. That would indicate that it's annual. Um, it's at JFK Middle School, and it benefits the Northampton Education Foundation. Uh, they're currently looking for uh, teams of spellers, sponsors, and um, any donations or underwriters are very welcome. You can go to the Northampton Education Foundation website to find out more. Uh, Your Honor, this is your moment in the sun. You so speaking of spelling bees, actually, uh, I was asked by the um, NHS Theater Department to uh, hold up this poster tonight because tonight is opening night for the uh, latest NHS musical, which is entitled the 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. Um, Seven o'clock is their uh, their their opening night is tonight. They'll also have 7 p.m. shows uh, tomorrow and Saturday, as well as a matinee at 2 p.m. Uh, adults $10, students and seniors $8. So they put on amazing shows. And so I encourage members of the public to uh, to go check it out. Would account for the low attendance tonight, I would imagine. That's, it could affect our viewership, your viewership. So, uh, okay. Um, 
The only other, the only other um, announcement I wanted to make was um, I know that uh, we've gotten some inquiries, and I just thought it would be helpful to, to review a little bit about the um, picking of snow, um, because that tends to be the, um, the big question. Um, I see uh, uh, news crews, you know, in front of the snow mountains, you know, it's, a, it's like a it's like perfect story, I suppose. But um, I guess I just want to review that um, we basically just came through um, about a 22 hour uh, snow operation. Um, our crews were out at about 4 a.m. Uh, the morning of uh, Stella, uh, Stella Blizzard, hashtag Stella Blizzard. Um, uh, doing pre-treating and then plowing all throughout the night, um, we ceased operations about 2 a.m. Um, so one of the things that uh, we are uh, have to consider um, is the fact that, A, we have to let our employees um, sleep. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, many of them have to come into work um, the next morning and work during the day. Um, the other consideration is, is that in order to move to picking operations, it requires them to um, remove plows uh, and remove sanders from their uh, dump trucks and other apparatus. So there's a little bit involved. Um, the reason there's some waiting happening is because there is a forecast for additional snow um, later this week. Um, it, they're being somewhat um, vague about it, um, but there is the potential for some additional snow this week. So we're, we're waiting, we're watching the forecast. Um, and obviously allowing our crews to, um, to uh, uh, recover, um, and then we are planning to, uh, to attack the snow as usual and try to clean up the snow mound. So we obviously ask people to be patient, um, to drive and walk cautiously in the meantime. Um, and I know that um, uh, our director, Donald Escalia, has been talking to various counselors and citizens who've um, pointed out uh, you know, different areas of the city that need attention, and they're doing our best to address them. Um, the snow was, for those of you who shovel your driveway like I do, uh, the snow was quite voluminous, and it got a little heavy toward the end as it started getting wet. Um, and so it's always a fine line between, um, you know, uh, not pushing the snow far enough or pushing it too far and taking out mailboxes. So I know we had some mailboxes that were taken out during the storm and, uh, and we'll be working with those residents to try to get that rectified. So that's the, uh, that's the snow update. But I do want to thank our DPW uh, crews um, that were out. Um, I want to thank our police and fire rescue um, who had a relatively quiet day, um, but obviously were there to respond to people. We had a few disabled vehicles. And then obviously thank the members of the public who heeded the, uh, the warnings about staying in, staying in and staying off the roads uh, where it was safe to allow uh, plowing and emergency operations to happen. So that's my report. Thank you. Um, that will bring us right up to the consent agenda. Um, I'll accept a motion to remove some of these items. Uh, well, can you indicate which one? <laughs> yeah, can you, can you. Uh, we want to remove, please, uh, the Nur al Muhammad and Nicholas Guardia and Sarah Gibbons from the. Uh, from the consent agenda. Yes, please. And there's a second. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor of removing those items, please say aye. 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 Can I ask for a point of clarification? We voted last meeting to refer them. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, and so they shouldn't be on the agenda tonight. And this is also just for clarification for those in the audience because um, we need to hear the report back from the committee right. with their recommendations or lack thereof. That, that's correct. That's why okay. these three items are being removed from the agenda, the consent agenda. Discuss more of that once we come to those, but that's that's absolutely correct. I had to seek clarification about it, so I thought that maybe others would want to know. Well, thank you for sharing. <laughs> I affirm you. <laughs> okay, so that leaves us uh, in in the consent agenda, which is, which is item 17.246, uh, and that's uh, the Council on Aging, Deborah Epstein of 168 uh, Maple Ridge Road in Florence. Um, <coughs> With a term starting January and this uh, starting January 2017, expiring Je June 2020, 
replacing the unexpired term of Margaret LaSalle. Uh, also for the historic commission, we have Pauline Fogel, 16 Forbes Avenue in Northampton. Uh, the term starting September 2016, expiring June 2019. It's a reappointment. Um, and then we have in the housing partnership, Kyla Pryor, 32 Bliss Street in Florence, with a term starting February 2017 expiring June 2020 is replacing the expired term of Rachel Taylor Dowart. Uh, and then also to approve the City Council minutes of March 2nd, 2017. Okay, so that, uh, Second. The motion to be made <coughs> on the, uh, to accept the, the agenda, uh, the consent agenda is there a second? Second. Okay, we'll just, uh, no, no discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 So the items that were removed were uh, Nicholas Guardia of Ninawaga Avenue uh, for Arts Council and Sarah Gibbons, also uh, from 295 South Street, also for Arts Council and Nural Mohammed of 34 Michaelman Avenue from the Human Rights Commission. And those items... <coughs> are those are still in committee. And still in committee, and we've yet to get a report back from those, and so those items will we will be revisiting those next time, okay, as Councilor Klein kindly pointed out. So now we go into recess, recess uh, for uh, the Finance Committee that was chaired by Councilor Murphy. Thank you. Um, Pam, would you call the roll of finance? Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Nash. Here. Excellent. So the first thing is just a public hearing announcement that the City Council will consider the Capital Improvements Program for FY 2018 through 2022. Uh, the, a public hearing is hereby advertised and announced in accordance with the Charter of Northampton, Massachusetts, Article 7, Finance and Fiscal Procedures, Section 7-5, Capital Improvements Program Public Hearing. Uh, by order of the City Council, a public hearing will be held on Tuesday, March 28th, 2017 at 7 p.m. in the City Council Chambers uh, right here at 212 Main Street, Northampton, Massachusetts. The City Council will consider capital improvements program for FY18 <coughs> through 22, and here are all persons who wish to be considered. And that is actually a finance committee meeting, right? Yes. <coughs> and posted as a council meeting in case the rest oh, of the councilors. Yep. Okay. Um, so that's our announcement. And, and the mayor's here. Do you want to say anything about that since you're at the podium? No. Excellent. All right. So now we need to approve minutes of two meetings. First, uh, do we have a motion to approve minutes of February 28th, 2017? Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion, corrections? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And the other is to approve our minutes of March 2nd, 2017. Do we have a motion? Second. 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 Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, next, we have um, some financial orders. And these, I think, are prior year bills. Uh, it's 17.263 in order to authorize payment of two prior fiscal year bills upon the recommendation, recommendation of the mayor. Be it ordered that the council authorizes the payment of two prior year bills, um, $186.88 to Cabot Risk, Strate Risk Strategies uh, for an employee injury claim from 2015 and $235 to your membership uh, from May 2016 for a water superintendent advertisement. Do we have a motion to put it on the floor? Make a motion to put it on the floor. Second. Second. And again, two more bills that got misdirected um, to, to the wrong department and did, were not paid during the fiscal year. And so we, we obviously have to pay them and we have the fund money to pay them, but because we're in a new fiscal year, we need the council to, uh, to authorize that. Any questions for the mayor about these councilors? Your, your membership? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, um, it's an odd thing. It's, it's, it's the American, uh, New England Water Works Association. Um, and I guess their, their website, uh, is called 
your membership or something like that. That's what it says on the invoice. Okay. So when we were advertising for a new water superintendent, uh, we did a 30-day uh, job posting on the New England Water Works Association, which is so where it's a trade journal for, it's people, trade journal like for people, people in the water industry. So, um, so it was a, a charge, you know, for for that job posting. And so, yeah, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Council of Arch. Yes, Mayor, maybe you could explain the hundred and eighty-six dollars and eighty-eight cents um, for Cabot Ristretti's July two thousand fifteen. Yes. And this is it because of that injury that went on for a period of time, and that's why that bill was not paid? Well, there was a little bit of a delay. It was related to uh, one of our um, staff, um, and Cabot Risk Strategies is, is one of our insurers that deals with disability claims. And this was specifically for, um, uh, for a payment for an emergency room visit and for some testing uh, for carbon monoxide and um, and it's a, so that happened and it went to our insurance company it was part of a larger file um, and uh, and for some reason there was some confusion about whether the bill should have gone to the fire rescue department or should have gone to HR so um, that's how it uh, did not get uh, paid and so we've identified that it needs to be paid thank you yep any other questions for the mayor on these two priorities Hearing no other questions, <coughs> all in favor of a positive recommendation from finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, and, and now, um, if you'll recall, we elected Councillor um, Adams. 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 Adams? Councillor Adams was our vice chair at the beginning of the session. <laughs> and then Councillor Adams left us. <laughs> What? It's like he was here only yesterday. <laughs> 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 Councilor who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Councilor Adams. Right. But he was our vice chair, and he's no longer with us. So Sounds we like need a new died. vice chair. So <laughs> I would open nominations for vice chair of finance from the finance committee members. Councilor. I'd like to nominate Councilor Carney. Second. I do too. Councilor. You accept, Councilor Carney? Yes, I'll accept. Thank oh, you. Can I, can I have a second on the opening of the nominations? Oh, the opening. We didn't do that, so we have to do that. Why? Well, yeah. I, I sort of opened nominations, and then you nominated. So. Yeah, I thought it was following procedure. That's okay. pretty close. But, <laughs> but was that also uh, a, a motion to open nominations? Oh, let's do that. A motion. <laughs> to, okay. I need a second. Uh, we have a second. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love procedure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now, now that we're open, uh, a, a nomination? Councillor Carney. Second. <laughs> yes. Councillor Carney. <laughs> speech. Speech. <laughs> you like to make a speech? Uh, thank you. No, no thanks. All right. All in favor of electing Councillor Carney vice chair? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations, Councillor Carney. Thank you. Not the cleanest election we've ever held, <laughs> but I think it, I think it passes muster. Um, and uh, now um, we've had this, this committee study request kicking around for a very long time. If you recall, um, the council president and vice president wanted us to consider how we could make our budget hearings uh, more interesting and draw more members of the public. And I know you all talked about it at the meeting that I missed, and it was kind of continued to this meeting. So uh, we entertain <coughs> suggestions from anyone on the council because they're not, the budget hearings aren't held by finance, they're held by the entire council. And that we were charged with coming up with suggestions uh, at finance, it really is for everyone to be involved with because it's actually the council's budget hearings. So I'll throw it out on the floor. Councilor? Well, I'll start, but you kind of announced that you might have some ideas to share. Well, I have some, some ideas, but okay, I don't so want to dominate the discussion. So. Oh, okay. Thank you. I mean, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you what I've been thinking about, and I did mention this yeah. the other night to several counselors, but well, I would put it out on the floor for. I would just to frame the discussion. I think that um, I guess uh, the train has kind of has left the station in terms of. Uh, 
doing something different on the capital improvement program hearing and the water and sewer hearing because we're just we're just doing those. Although I'd, I'd note that um, um, in the time between the announcement and the actual hearings on them, I think we should do something similar I individually as I'm going to suggest we do for the for the operating uh, for the operating budget, which is um, we should. Um, do our best to just get it out to our constituents. Radical, radical concept, but I think there actually has to be uh, a concerted, uh, if not concerted, a, a a a definite and real effort to do that. Whether it's on social media, whether it's uh, on our email lists or neighborhood listservs, or whether in some maybe we can experiment with old-fashioned snail mail and, and postcards, depending on each of the wards. Um, but I think it's important that there be some activity from the council to get people to come. And so I'd suggest something similar for the operating budget. When, when, in, when the hearing is announced, and we need two weeks, correct, between the announcement and the actual hearing, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. That two weeks should not just be static. It should be time that we use to get people to come. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the instrument that we use or the announcement, um, I think, could be improved. I heard Councillor Bidwell um, speak about this, and I think others have spoke about this as well, um, highlighting that this is more than just, you know, just everything. There are very specific issues that people are going are gonna to be especially interested in. Um, a lot of it is going to be kind of physical in nature, you know, what, um, and, and some of that was going to be in the capital improvement program, but we can still sort of highlight and talk about it you know, the roads that are going to be paved, the infrastructure that um, needs improvement. Um, and that kind of bread and butter of the municipal budget, I think, deserves to be highlighted. And I think there are um, some thematic hooks we can use. I mean, certainly there are a lot of people who are concerned about um, uh, threats from the, f the federal government to um, defund local communities uh, because of their policies. Um, uh, that, like the one Northampton has uh, on being a, a sanctuary city. That's a, a threat that I think is largely without merit, um, but we can certainly highlight that. Um, we can also highlight the important things that are not being uh, advanced at the federal level from housing uh, to community policing and those kinds of things. So I think if we, if we put our heads together and come up with some thematic hooks and maybe the finance committee wants to recommend <clears throat> that you know the council president and vice president actually draft something. Um, if we do that, then I think we should spend that two weeks in in all seven wards, uh, actively pushing it out to the people who live there. So that's kind of the overall frame of how I think about this. But I imagine others have specific ideas of how they would want it to look. Mm -hmm. now, I know Council Murphy does. We've discussed this, and, mm -hmm. and actually Council O'Donnell does too. He's holding it the best right now, but they're actually good ideas, and I think um, it's a, the issue of framing. Normally what we've done in the past is we've invited department heads to come and speak about their departments, which in the main, the councils already know, so it's actually preaching to the choir, and it's reiterating information that we already have access to, and it doesn't necessarily speak to the the essence of what a budget is. And when I've said this before, and I'm not the only one who's ever said this, it's not my unique thought, but the, the budget is essentially a moral document. It expresses the community's commitment and devotion to its priorities and how they're defined. And I, and I speak about this in context of the most recent budget that was proposed by the President, for instance, which is an amoral document, but it's, it is essentially but it does have impacts, and one of the ones is eliminating community development block grant funds, which actually Northampton relies on um, to a, a, a pretty great extent to provide for the most at-risk communities and to leverage money for those agencies that help them. We might not have anything if, if this budget is approved, um, among other things. And so the president, has made his moral statement by presenting his budget. The mayor and the council will be making our statement about our moral document. And maybe if it's framed in that respect and not something as 
unsexy is d describing line items in various departments. It allows people to express, I think we invite people to express where, their, where the community priorities are. It's not for us to presume them based on the fact that we were voted by a majority. It's, it's for us to actually solicit. And I think in that respect, we should hear from the public what it is that we, where we should place our priorities and how we should finance them. So to that extent, that is kind of what Councilor Murphy and O'Donnell were talking about, um, um, maybe changing the way we structure and conduct these meetings differently from what we've done in the past, which admittedly can be a bit of a snooze. So let me just kind of outline. I mean, I'll, I'll present my suggestions at the at the end of the outline. But the the budget is is essentially the mayor's proposed budget, and just for the limited people here and the folks watching at home, the mayor presents us with a budget. We can cut the budget, but we cannot add things to the. But we can't change it. We can just cut things, which we've typically not done. Uh, at least this mayor has always presented us with a, a responsible budget. And uh, so we can cut, the, our authority is to cut things, not add things. We're going to do the water sewer on the 27th um, in the Public Works Committee. And it's now our, our, now we know that they're not proposing a change to that. So it's gonna be the same as the previous year. Uh, the next night at the Finance Committee, the Council's asked Finance to do the public hearing on the Capital Improvements Program. And the Capital Improvements Program will be from fiscal year 18, which is the budget year that we're doing, to 22. But the portion of it for 18 becomes part of the 18 budget. And the rest of it's in the program, but the part that we fund in 18 becomes part of that budget. So we'll do the public hearing for that. Um, on the 28th and then it will come up to council in April and again the reason for that is that a lot of the capital projects are with the schools and they need to be bid and contracted so the work can be done over the summer when there's no one in the schools you can't really be doing a roof on an elementary school when it's full of kids so that needs to go a little quicker so they can bid that out the the remainder of the budget you know the the operating budget is kind of what we're talking about here for these budget hearings now we'll get our budget books in the middle of May. And typically, the hearings we're talking about, the council holds on the departmental budgets prior to the budget being presented, the first meeting in June by the mayor, it has its public hearing and the council usually votes on it the first and second meetings in June. But we get our budget meetings uh, books in the middle of May and then the council holds budget hearings and in the past has talked to department heads about the departmental budgets. Again, remembering we can't add, we can't move, we can only cut. And typically we've not done that. We, at, we do our due diligence, we ask for detail, but we typically have not cut any budgets. Um, also remembering that the school committee is in charge of this, the school budget. We see the entire total line item pass through us but how it gets spent and the details on that are, is the jurisdiction of the school committee, not the city council. So we, we get a chance to see the total and approve the total, but how it's spent on a line item basis is done by the school committee, that's their purview, so we don't have control over that. Um, what we've done in the past is have meetings over several nights with different departments and brought through department heads. And it's been my observation, I mean, it's my 12th year, that not all of even us are available every night we schedule those because people have other commitments. My recommendation was going to be um, that we make it easier for the public to attend. We make it easier for it to be packaged into a television program like this meeting that will be replayed over and over and again for the insomniacs that what we try and do, there are five departments that are the bulk of our budget, public safety, police, fire, schools, DPW, and, uh, and uh, central services that takes care of all of our property. Those five spend the bulk of the money in the city. That what we try to do is do those all <coughs> one council meeting, the, the big budget hearing. We do it and ask NCTV to televise it, televise it like a regular council meeting so it gets full coverage, not just a little camera, but full coverage. And to get it all done in one night, that we have the mayor and finance director 
do the presentation on the departmental budgets, not the department heads. So we're not rotating people. Uh, the mayor and the finance director know those budgets about as well as the department heads do, that they do it and go from one to the next to the next to the next to streamline it. That way if people want to commit an evening to come and sit in the audience and listen to it, they're going to get the bulk of our spending all in one night with the mayor and finance director presenting and they know the budget better than anybody else does. We'll have our budget books in the middle of May. We should probably do this meeting between when we get the budget books and the end of the month. And if, if we'll have our budget books. If we look through the budget books and there's something sort of esoteric we want to know about, just email the mayor or the finance director and say, hey, this is not a big thing, but I'm interested in it. Would you please research it so you got the answers because I'm going to ask about it at a council meeting. And then if there is a need to do any of the smaller departments, because after those five, the amount of money they spend drops off dramatically. Um, but that way we package it into one night covering the bulk of our spending. We make it meaningful if somebody wants to come and see it because it covers the bulk of the money we spend in a year. It will move along quickly and efficiently with the mayor and the finance director being here. And we will have our budget books in advance of it. So if there's anything kind of esoteric or not a major line item thing that we want to ask about, that we have the opportunity to email the finance director and the mayor and say, I know this isn't a mainline thing, but I want to ask about it. Would you please make sure you got the details on it for me? And then we do that hearing and see if being done in one night, it will, we can draw people in to see where the bulk of the money in the big departments goes to. And again, knowing that our authority is to cut it, but we can't move things around. But it is our due diligence to show that we reviewed it, that we've gone over it and asked questions of the mayor finance director. And it doesn't mean we can't say get back to us when the public hearing happens, the first meeting in June. But anyways, that, I, I've thought a lot about it since you brought it up. And that's my suggestion as a way to streamline it, make it easier for people to come and hear the bulk of the spending, and turn it into a replayable television program like a council meeting that will cover most of our spending, not all of it, but the big departments where all of our money gets spent. And I, I would throw that up, you know, set the stage and throw it up. Um, <clears throat> I, like, I like this idea, and I'm certainly willing to give it a try. I just want to offer a little bit of a different perspective on um, bringing in department heads. I think that there is value, and I think it's true that we do have access to them, um, but usually when we're interacting with them, we're talking about specific situations or instances or things that they're dealing with. This is our opportunity to kind of to have them lay out holistically their view of their department and what their priorities are and how they manage it over a whole year. And, and I, I always find that interesting, and I think that it has value. So I, I like the idea of packaging it. I would still like to have department heads. Just a question. Do you, want, do you want them just in the room, or do you want them to do the presentations of their own budgets? I, I like having them do presentations because, again, I like hearing their view of their department and what their priorities are. Mm -hmm. So you're good with the concept of doing the big five in one Absolutely. night but have the department heads here to do it themselves. That would be my preference. Uh, Councillor. I have to agree with Councillor Gina Lascara. Um, I think it's very valuable to have the department heads to come and present about their departments. I feel very comfortable with that, and I think to say, you know, no, we're just going to have the mayor or the financial director doing a budget, I want to hear from the department heads myself. I want to see the visibility, and I want to be able to ask something if I want to hear what I want to hear. So I don't have a problem with it. So am I hearing the, the concept of doing the big departments all in one night is fine, but we'd like to have the individual department heads here mm -hmm. to do the presentations of their budgets themselves. Right. All right. Any other I'm comments? Or? With that. Just a, uh, Oops, oh, I'm ahead. sorry, a logistical. So uh, this would be at the first budget hearing, or it would be a proceeding. It would be a, a preliminary be, meeting in May, would the end be, of May. It would be, you know, and again, and again, I don't. I know in the past we've done multiple nights and heard from smaller departments, but 
my concept was trying to focus the big departments all in one night. So if a member of the public only had one night to give to this, they could come, be in the audience, and hear what's going on with the bulk of our spending in one night. If the council then chose to hear from a smaller department at another meeting, you know, the, somebody who made a commitment to come for the evening would hear the bulk of our spending. It doesn't mean you couldn't decide you wanted to have another meeting. And we, in the past, we've had up to three um, to bring in a smaller department if you want to hear from them. But I'm trying to make it easy for a member of the public to say, you know, I got one night to give to this. If I come this night, I'll hear the top five, I'll hear where the bulk of the money gets spent. And, and if I can come another night, great. But it would focus the big departments, make it easy for somebody to review the bulk of our spending with us. And then if the council wanted to have another night, they could have another night. But it would, it would let a member of the public use their time meaningfully if they come to join us and make one composite television program to rerun that covers the big departments and make it easier for people to keep up with it. Councilor, you were. Yeah, um, for, for some time, the state has allowed cities and towns to engage in remote participation. I don't think we've ever done it in Northampton. But, you know, what about the average citizen who uh, can't get here for this night? Uh, what, what remote participation options do we offer that person? And so perhaps in addition to the format of the actual meeting, I like the idea of having something that is watchable mm -hmm. and postable on Facebook and that kind of thing. I wonder if we could figure out something to solicit actual questions from our constituents ahead of time so that we all we have them. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're groupable and into themes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that would be good to, to in, in the announcement of the hearing, not just come sit in the audience and, and listen to something, but participate by asking the questions that are on your mind and identify the things that are important to you. Mm -hmm. I, um, I wonder if we could set that up mm -hmm. through, the, uh, through our administrative assistant um, or some way, so. Can I just ask a question about the, the, what you're thinking about in terms of the public hearing versus the department leaders coming to speak? Mm -hmm. will, will all that happen in one night? No, the public, we typically had our budget hearings prior to the meeting where the mayor presents the budget because the budget usually gets presented at the first meeting in June. We have our public hearing then. But this was when the council met before that to go over individual budgets. Uh, so we did <coughs> that prior to the mayor actually presenting the budget and the public hearing was usually at the first council meeting in June. And the first vote, first reading was at that first meeting, but we'd already done our, our homework before that. Uh, and to Councillor um, O'Donnell's question, I don't, could we, you know, it, the meeting would be live I'm wondering if we could accept email questions from people watching at home uh, that could be passed to the chair and, and uh, if, they're, you know, if they're salient, the chair could say, I have a question from somebody at home about this or that. I mean, I don't see why we couldn't do that. Well, the remote participation law only applies to us, uh, us <laughs> uh, deliberators in voting. So it doesn't disqualify. There are no rules precluding um, constituent personal uh, participation questions sent electronically or otherwise, during texting, yeah. uh, emailing. I, I get phone calls during the meetings all the time. I, I don't answer them. But I mean, that is something it seems to me that we could do in a rather primitive fashion. I don't think we right now have a, I mean, it's kind of short notice to set up some official portal to allow people to, to, to uh, start sending stuff in. But I don't know, maybe Antonio could fix something up. Or we could just post on the on the uh, screen for the NCTV uh, program. You know, email your question. Remembering that it'll be recorded and played later, so that that people will be emailing into the ethers on replay. But during live broadcast, something has a contact point, an email address, my email address that could come right to uh, my my uh, computer, and then we can read those aloud as well and, and include those that's so an interesting idea. Yeah. so I mean I, I think that's possible it won't be real gee whiz technology it's a, the most basic level that we've got but yeah might get some prank calls but <laughs> I've okay. participated in some of these things uh, in other other and yeah there's some 
some mass live mavens who sometimes <laughs> decide to share their their cogent thoughts. So we we, we reserve the right to filter out some, but yeah, that's sort of like don't a, announce the wrong Oscar winner or something like mm -hmm. that. We'll try not to. But it's yes. sort of like a like playing a home version of the budget council budget hearings and mm -hmm. but that's an interesting concept to let people email in questions if they're watching because mm -hmm. we can't get them in the room you know we could at least get them to email in their questions if they watch it at home that's an interesting yeah. suggestion so if part of the recommendation from, from finance on this uh, concept could be simply that council president will ask Antonio, our, our information technology director, and see if it could be done. And if it can be done, maybe we just we should do it. Any, any other comments? Or, uh, Councilor? Um, yeah, I, 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 I like the idea of, of, the, f of, the five, of, of, of those five departments that represent, what, 85% or something? I don't know what the number is, of, 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 of total city budget. Uh, but I, I, I agree there is something to be said for department heads themselves being here. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps um, if there are questions pertaining to any of the other departments, we would have the mayor on hand and, Su and Susan Wright on hand for, for, for things that fall outside of those, 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 those five departments. Um, and I, uh, I uh, yes, I, I have been talking with several folks about the, the messaging and how to, how, to, how to make it more interesting, how to, Look, ask prov somewhat provocative questions about it's very specific pieces of the budget to get th that we know folks are interested in, and uh, and and get that out in advance, along with a request for for if you have any questions, get them to us in advance. You can also do it live, but but get them to us in a, in advance so that if there if there are a series of questions that bundle together, we can give the the mayor and department heads a chance to to to, to think about those. And if I can just just finish. Um, and uh, I, I encourage, uh, once, once we're clear on just what the sequence of events is and how we're going to message it, um, I, I've, I've had a surprisingly uh, positive response. I sent a, a, neat, uh, a newsletter out to my ward, uh, about 500 folks on, on Tuesday. I, th I, think I, I think it went out to the rest of you as well. And I got really, really nerdy about, you know, I walked folks through the whole, the whole budget process and what looked like the budget timeline with information still to come on, on, on hearings and links to water and sewer background and to the capital improvement. And I've had um, seven or eight responses. And, you know, as these things go, that's quite a few. And uh, with, with uh, all folks already, had some had some questions, and I said, "Well, I'll either look at it or come to the hearing, and you'll and you'll get a treasure." So I, I would uh, I, I, I would encourage my colleagues that if if you want to take what I did and repackage it yourselves and send it out with all the, with all the same links, feel 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 free to do it. But uh, I, I, I for me, it's reinforcing that yeah, there is a way that you can put this out there, and folks will pay attention, and we'll see if they sh come to come to the hearing. But um, I think there's a good chance some will. Just a question for the mayor. When we, when do you post the budget online? Because as Councillor Bidwell said, you know, people may have specific questions, but they need to see the budget. We get our budget book. Is it online then? When does, when do you, when do you all post it for the public to see it? Um, I'm required to submit it. Um, I believe it's May 45 uh, this year, or maybe May 16th. I'm not sure. Yeah. But um, we generally it goes online simultaneously with us getting our budget book. My sending it to you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it, we, we put it up online um, on the budget page. When we get our budget? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's usually there for people okay. to. The question was just because Councillor Bidwell said if they have specific questions, but they have specific questions, they need to have seen the budget. But it will be online when we get our books. So if councillors let you know, if your constituents let them know that they can look at it online, because for a constituent to have a specific question, they'd have to be able to see the budget. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure it was simultaneous. Councillor Klein, you had a. I had a perfect segue from Councillor Bidwell, but we had a, something in the middle here. Just to follow up on the, um, the kind of outreach piece and how each of us can play a role and how, I mean, I have a procedural question, but I also have a, want to make a plug for um, our ability as counselors to activate our networks through our 
ward listservs, email that we send out, um, our um, civic associations, the lead civic association is very active, the Florence Business and Civic Association is quite active. So we have all these mechanisms that I feel like we can send this information out through. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering, in terms of the Finance Committee's role, are you um, able to kind of create some language for us? Are you going to kind of set those things in motion, or is it up to each of us counselors? I mean, what, what's the best way for us to actually create? I, I'd like to have some kind of strategic plan in place around the, um, the outreach piece. The, the question, the budget hearings we're talking about are not a finance committee event, they're a council event. So, um, you know, we, we were asked to study how to make this whole thing more scintillating for people to come and deal with and make it more meaningful. But it is, you know, it's a council held thing, not a finance held thing. We do, we're doing the capital improvements because council asked us to do that, uh, but not the, not these budget hearings. They're a council wide thing. So, I mean, if you, if the council wants to ask finance to come up with a framework for it, that's fine. But it, it's not a finance committee event. It's a council overall council event. It will be a council meeting because it's a council budget hearing. So, I mean, it sounds like we have a template. I didn't actually, I don't think I got that email and I'd love to see it, mm -hmm. but we have something that Councillor Bidwell has created and each of us could possibly adapt that and send out to our networks. But again, if we could kind of map out somehow or the finance committee, just because you're the most likely people to do that, create some kind of strategic plan about how we would do that outreach, I think it would be really useful. It would, it would give us kind of guidelines of how we're gonna do this outreach. The only other thing I wanna say really quickly is that um, we might also wanna suggest that people do viewing parties, you know, whether it be neighborhood viewing parties or something like that if people don't wanna come here. But, um, you know, I could imagine, people are laughing, but I could imagine the Lead Civic Association doing something like that, you know, putting together in somebody's house um, a, a kind of viewing party. So I'm just thinking, you know, just creative ways to suggest to people there are all these different ways you can do this. What, drinking games and stuff? If that's You're what works. <laughs> Gee, I might want to remote participate and go to one of those instead. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Uh, yeah, but, um, you could do black tie and, you know, really do it up. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Um, I like that idea about drawing something up in notifying the Florence Civic Association and so forth, which could be done on the website and sending it to the president of the um, Florence Civic Association in, in the associations in general in the wards. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. I think what would be important is determining, is I, it really changes the dynamic if we do all five in one night, but the real, the real game changer is if we can take questions from the public at home by having them email in to us what their questions are, then to some extent it increases participation. It means, you know, if somebody's interested but they can't get a babysitter, they can watch at home and send us questions. That to me would really open it up. And before we, before we write, write a plan for this, I think it'd be good to get that question answered because I think it's a different plan if we can set it up for people to watch from home and send us questions than it is to simply say, well, you've got to come into the room. I think it's a real game changer if they can, if they're watching at home, they can send us a question. If, you know, if they can't get a babysitter, if they <laughs> have a sick kid, they, they can still play the home version of the budget hearings. I think the council president offered his email. Yeah, uh, right now, <laughs> however, uh, there's that's, a, filter, I know. There's a filter that doesn't allow for emails to, for incoming emails and or Facebook. So, so we'd have to talk to Antonio to see if we can get a bypass on those filters that would allow for that to happen. That would be a very good idea. Oh, if I just directly I can Ethernet in? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's, a, that's Pam's a really address, topic. too. I mean, they could come into Pam, right? Yeah. No, that'd be cool. That would be excellent. Yeah, emails are coming in. Yeah. But so there's general buy in to at least packaging the big five departments in one night, still preferring to have the department heads come and do it themselves. And we can see about the public emailing and questions, but I think all in all, it, and we'd have the mayor and the finance director here as well to fill in the gaps. And I think it would, if somebody wanted to come out and come in, they could cover the bulk of the budget with a one night <coughs> commitment 
and then if the council wants to engage more departments, smaller departments after that, we can still do it. But I like yeah. the idea of them emailing directly right, during the right event. to our council president. I think that would be good during the hearings. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion on this, uh, council? I, I was just just, just going to add that. Uh, I will send my piece around again, but, but it, the one thing it didn't include and said, we'll get back to you about this, was the specific dates, is, and, and that's when I had imagined, however, we've, we've decided to message this, you know, how, you know, however, to describe it with some specific questions that will be, that will, that will be addressed, and, I, and I've, I've heard Councillor O'Donnell volunteer himself and the council president to, to, to take some of these ideas that we've heard and to put it together into that messaging and, I, I heard that too. Yeah. and, yeah. and I think I think that would be I think that would be quite quite helpful and, and then we've all you know we can do with it what we want but then you, you've got a combination of some of the background materials that I put together plus for this event that's going to take place on the night of blah 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 come and this is what you're going to expect to hear mm -hmm. but you want to package and when you when you do that outreach we want to know when the hearing is. We want to have the URL address for the budget so they can very yep. easily get to the budget. And then theoretically the address that they could send yep. an email to during the meeting so they'd have it all, here's where you can see the budget, here's where you can send your question, and here's the night of the meeting. And yes, I think that, that'd be great. And, and then we all, we've all got the standard paragraph to use. We can plug it in in different ways. But I think that'd be very helpful. Um, so, oh, Councilor. Uh, so uh, we talked about the th thematic hooks, and is that what Councillor Dwight and Councillor O'Donnell are going to work on? So yes, if we I have do. ideas, send them to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you know, um, you know, doing my work with the City Democratic Committee, there's a there's a lot of energy out there around uh, a lot of different issues, and yeah, and I could I could, and a number of us are, are involved with that, and we can send you. Lots of pertinent in information. So, um, just to ride a dying horse here, um, are we just going to? Uh, each counselor will kind of make a decision about where they're going to send out whatever material gets shaped by the council president and vice president. Um, but I think that we have to be thinking about a press release as well mm -hmm. to go out in good advance of the act the hearing not the day before so people can actually put it in their calendars um and there was something else i was thinking oh and we talked a lot about kind of social media but what does that mean and who is going to be responsible for that again is that going to be each counselor uses their own pages or whatever they have or is this um, an opportunity to launch a city council facebook page or something along those lines yeah, I think that's it's specific to this event. <coughs> so you can use this referral. It'll have links, comments. Folks can even put questions on there, too. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go through those. Um, memes. Would somebody Probably. like to um, volunteer to I'll oversee volunteer to that, that piece that of it? It's all set up once we have everything. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank Council you. Council chair is real good. I'm getting, yeah. I'm getting my wish fulfilled a little bit here. <laughs> good. <laughs> so uh, just to kind of wrap this up, uh, Council President, Council Vice President, uh, did we fulfill our committee study request uh, to your satisfaction? Can we check this off our list at this point? I believe there's supposed to be a report. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. A PowerPoint. Yeah, our, when, when will that report be we'll, uh, submitted? I'm prepared to accept the discussion as a report. <laughs> because the budget <laughs> season will expire by the Before we get, yeah. Citizens. This so, has been kicking around for a while. You can use uh, my minutes. Yeah. We'll uh, use, use Councillor yeah. Bidwell really likes to write these reports. and <laughs> Yeah, he does. Yeah, I'd like to encourage others to do that. <laughs> well, I, I would encourage someone from the finance committee if they were. Yeah, this is quite. The, but Maybe a report after, you know, once we've assessed. Sure. Yes, an assessment afterwards. Yeah. Assessment afterwards. Assessment afterwards. afterwards. It work. Assessment I mean, this is this has been good. kicking around for a while, so I want to. You know, it would be helpful if this, if, if at this point this discussion was the culmination of the committee study request, and then once we try this new approach, to maybe do a a, a, post, a -mortem. post mortem, post -mortem, if you were yeah. on how to do it did it work or didn't it work, and I mean everybody's going to have their own opinions as to was it or was it not an improvement 
over a multi-night thing? Uh, and did we get more participation in the room or the exciting part? Do we get people emailing in more than pizza orders? And did they have something salient to ask? And were they, were they in the game? We could offer pizza at the hearing. Uh, we don't have a budget. Council of Donald, so. Yes, sir. Well, let me thank the Committee on Finance for its thoughtfulness and uh, <laughs> exhaustive uh, uh, creative explorations. I, I do think there are many good ideas. And so I, I, as far as I'm concerned, it satisfies you the satisfied committee our request. Our and I would just say as a, as a follow-up, um, I guess there's three weeks between now and the next council meeting. Maybe that's enough time for the council president and I to take the, these ideas that have been discussed and maybe present something. Uh, maybe in written form, as Councillor Klein is, is talking about, that others could use, um, maybe at the next meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems like plenty of time. We don't have to make it complicated. You know, I don't know we need to set up our own centralized Facebook page right now. Ultimately, I, I do like that idea, but maybe for this we just... Sounds like we have an events page going up, though. Right. An events page, an events page right? from our individual accounts, I suppose. But, well, but it'll be an events page, and then everyone can link to that events page exactly. from our individual accounts. Yeah. But we don't have to create a... Anyway. Right, not it. But anyway, that would be my suggestion, and then th that would be uh, the next step, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On behalf of finance, I would like to thank the council president and vice president <laughs> for taking it to that higher level. <laughs> and uh, with that, I'll ask if there's any new business to come before finance we didn't know about. Hearing none, a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We're back in regular session now. Um, so, let's scroll back up here. Now, um, we go back to the financial orders, some of you heard just a little while ago. The first one is item 17.263. This is an order to authorize payment of two prior fiscal year bills. So this will be a first reading. I'll accept a motion. To approve. Any discussion on this item? Roll call, please. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Sheriff. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading and it will be revisited in our first meeting in April. Um, this is a uh, second reading. This is an item 17.258. This is to appropriate $1,668,582 for paying the cost of roof replacement at the Bridge Street School. Move to approve it. Any further discussion on this? Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shera? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. All right, that passes in second reading. It's completed. Item 17.259. This is a financial order to appropriate $1 $775,294 for paying the cost of roof replacement at the Leeds Elementary School. Second. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Uh, need discussion? Hearing none, uh, roll call, please. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labar? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Sheriff? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes, so that passes in second reading. Now we come to orders, item 16.264. This is in order to establish the water and sewer rates for FY 2018. And this is for a referral to the Committee on Public Yorks and Utilities and the Committee on Finance. Move to refer. Second. Any discussion on the referral? Uh, it should be noted that the first meeting of Public Works, I believe, will be presided over by the Vice Chair, uh, uh, Councilor Nash. And that is an opportunity for people to speak, weigh in on, and hear about the proposed water and sewer rates and the formula that, that establishes those. Uh, as Council Murphy noted, they are remaining unchanged. There will be no um, increased rates. What is the date on that meeting? 27th. The 27th. It's the day before the Finance Committee meeting where it will go to next. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that's referred to committees. Oh, I, I just want to ask a point of clarification. Did you want to discuss that order in finance on the 28th? <coughs> if, it, if it comes out of, we should put it on our budget or on our agenda because if it comes out of um, 
It should come out of Public Works on Monday, so we'll just deal with it on Tuesday. <coughs> okay. So put it on there. That's with, in addition to that. the capital improvement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. with with the rates not changing, yeah. okay. it should not be that okay. dramatic. Now. All right, next up, uh, next order is 17.260. This is an order authorizing joint operation of public activities agreement to implement, quote, Healthy Hampshire, Massachusetts in motion slash 1423 grant. This is the second reading. Um, there are two attached orders. The one approved in first reading and another is requested by the city solicitor and the council needs to accept the am uh, amendments as proposed uh, by Attorney Seawall. So first I'll accept the move motion move to put it on the floor. Make a motion. A second, okay. Is there a motion relative to the amendments? Move to adopt the amendments. Second. And, and um, let me see. Just the last paragraph. Yeah, and I could actually hear. <coughs> so the modified language, <coughs> well, I'll now read the whole order as amended or as the proposal. <coughs> Or that whereas Mass General Law, Chapter 40, uh, Subsection 4A, allows for joint operation of public activities among governmental units, and whereas Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Subsection 4A, requires that such intergovernmental agreements be approved in a city by the City Council and the Mayor, <coughs> and whereas the City of Northampton provides services to and shares services with other municipalities, uh, that the city, acting as the lead community through the planning and it should be T H R U G H, um, not T H R U. The Planning and Sustainability Department enter into a grant agreement with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and other Hampshire County towns to participate in a regional uh, effort to reduce the risk of diabetes, strokes, and heart disease by improving our social and built network environments to enable healthier living, and in doing so, agrees to work cooperatively with such municipalities in the region to implement the Healthy Massachusetts in Motion slash 1422. That was a great name, by the way. Grant from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health under a federal center, uh, under a federal center for disease control funding program while it still lasts. Um, so that's the language as amended. Uh, any discussion on that item? Uh, roll call, please. This is in second reading as amended. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Accept yeah. uh, all those in favor of accepting the amendments? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And out of the regular order itself, there's no further discussion on that as amended. All right. Roll call on that, please. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shera? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. As now we're into ordinances. Item 17.233, this is an ordinance relative to school zones. Uh, this is in first readings. Um, do, do, let's see, I'm too, let's, which one I should read? There's, um, okay. This is upon the recommendation of Council Ryan R. O'Donnell and it be ordained by the uh, City Council of the City of Northampton and the City Council Assembly as follows. That the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Strike. Um, section 312.18, established from the school zones by ordinance enumeration. A, a school zone shall be established by ordinance by a uh, vote of the City Council. The City Council shall refer to any proposed ordinance establishing a specific school zone to the Board of Public Works and the School Committee. No vote shall be taken on any such ordinance until the Board of Public Works and the School Committee have filed a report on the proposed ordinance with the City Council or 45 days of elapsed since the referral, whichever occurs first. And the following areas are hereby designated as school zones. Also continuing striking under school zones, the uh, City Council shall establish no school zone in the absence of a favorable recommendation from the Transportation Parking Commission. Replace with the following school zones are hereby established per Mass General Law Chapter 90, Section 17. And this is as revised by the Committee on Legislative Matters on January 9th. Um, Bridge Street School, strike the school zone on and start with on Union Street, strike shall and substitute with extending, strike on said street. 
to a uh, point eight hundred and at 283 feet westerly of Parsons Street, on Parsons Street, extending to a point 139 feet northerly of Union Street, and to a point 250 feet easterly of Union Street. On Bridge Street, extending from the northern edge of Parsons Street to the southern edge of Pomeroy Terrace. Uh, the Cutchins Program Campus, formerly the College Church School, um, strike uh, the school zone up and now just simply say on Pomeroy Terrace extending from Hancock Street to a point 200 feet north of Phillips Place Jackson Street School on Jackson Street extending from a point 80 feet south of the center line of Barrett Street located at the intersection with Jackson Street to a point 765 feet north of the center line of Barrett Street and located on the intersection with Jackson Street JFK Middle School on Bridge Road extending from a four, uh, point 45 feet east of the center line on Juniper Street located at the intersection of Bridge Road to a point 35 east of center uh, line of the Oak Street located at the intersection with Bridge Road. And mind you, there's been no changes in this other than the language, but uh, the, the distances remain the same as they currently are. For Leeds Elementary School on Florence Street, extending from a point 150 feet south of Southerly Crosswalk, to a point 150 feet north of the uh, Northerly Crosswalk in front of the Leeds Elementary School. And a new addition, Montessori School, on Industrial Drive extending from Bradford Street to a point 380 feet northerly on Bates Street extending from Bradford Street to North Street. And then with Ryan Road, on Ryan Road extending from a point 455 feet west of the center line of the driveway leading to the Ryan Road School to a point 770 feet east of the center line of the driveway leading to the Ryan Road School, and then adding also the Smith College Campus School on State Street, extending from the northern edge of Bedford Terrace to a point 60 feet north of the northern edge of Trumbull Road, and on Prospect Street, extending from the southern edge of Trumbull Road to a point 450 uh, feet south of Trumbull Road. Uh, -doom -doom -doom. And this is as uh, still uh, item 17.233 as revised on the Committee on Legislative Matters on January 9th. Um, reserved, this is also striking the school zone criteria speed limit. Um, it's also reserved. So the, all this section is struck, mm -hmm. both these sections, 312-17 and 312-19. Um, I'll spare you the reading since we're striking it all. But there we go, and I will defer to Councilor O'Donnell. Okay, thank you. You want a motion on it? Motion. To yeah, I would accept a motion to put this on the floor. Okay. May I first offer an amendment that was approved by the Transportation and Parking Commission and in legislative matters, but probably due to my era, error, although we discussed it, we didn't formally adopt the amendment. Uh, just because I know the council president would like to read a few more numbers for <laughs> you betcha yeah um, So we have a document I believe it's a second link yeah on the I don't know if our administrative assistant would be so so good as to see here That would be the amendment proposed by the TPC the PDF and this is uh, the measurements for additional school zone This is on the Lander Greenspoon Academy um, Prospects re extending from the edge uh, eastern edge of Adair place to point three hundred feet East of center line of the, on Franklin Street. Number two has already been adopted. adopted. And number two is what? Number number two is already represented in the ordinance. That right. So right. So I would move that we amend uh, the, the ordinance that's on the floor with the first amendment to add uh, a school zone on Prospect Street at that location. I second. Oh, okay. That's for the Lander Green School School. Okay. Mm -hmm. Adding that to the inventory of school. Yes. So, you, you want to um, expand on why the changes and the proposed changes? Sure. Should we vote on that amendment? Or? Um, sure. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of adding the Lander Green Spoon into the inventory, please say uh, aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Sorry, we should have done that in legislative matters. Um, okay. We have. A certain number of school zones that exist in the city today. Um, 
around JFK, our elementary schools, uh, around the Cutchins program campus. Um, this is something that cities can establish themselves without state permission um, when certain criteria are met. What it means is in a school zone, uh, the speed limit is reduced to 20 miles an hour during certain times of day when children are present. And so I thought it might be a good idea to look again at this ordinance and see other locations that would meet those criteria and expand the school zones um, as much as possible, as much as allowed by state law. And that's what you have in this ordinance. You have the addition of three new school zones on Prospect Street, Bates Street Industrial Drive, and then the Smith College Campus School, which is both State Street and Prospect Street. And in addition, you see the expansion of the Bridge Street, Bridge Street School school zone, which strangely does not today include Bridge Street itself. So Bridge Street School, and Ward 3, as Councilor Nash knows, we've talked about this um, a, gr a great deal in the Ward 3 Association. And um, I'd actually like to thank him for the outreach he's done on this, um, on this ordinance. Um, it's the only elementary school in the city without a, a flashing light that indicates that there's a, a school. Um, adding a school zone would allow us to, to add that signage there. Um, there are benefits, I think, to adding school zones at the other locations. And I'll just run through them briefly. Um, Montessori School on Bates Street and Industrial Drive. It's a school that is expanding to both sides of the street. There are going to be two crosswalks at that location. There is also a bike path right there, which is not a legal reason for a school zone, but it's kind of an ancillary benefit for having one. Um, it's also a cut through. There's lots of traffic that goes down that part of the city trying to get to Damon Road. The Smith College Campus School on the, on the Prospect Street side, for some reason there is a sign that says school zone but someone just stuck it there, stuck it there at some point, uh, um, which I admire. But we want to make it a real school zone on that street. Um, and the technical speed limit is actually 20 miles an hour posted on Prospect Street. So not much of a change. But on, on State Street, um, where the speed limit is um, 25 miles an hour, in 2009, the DPW did a traffic study there. And between um, Center Street and Main Street, the 85th percentile, so what 85% of all the drivers, the speed that 85% of the drivers are going is between 27 to 30. So that's speeding. And then north of Bright Street, um, the average gets up to 35 to 38 miles an hour. So there's definite speeding on State Street. And it's a, it's a place where you are either leaving or coming into downtown. It's a crucial entrance uh, into downtown. I also feel that unless you're from here, you may not really know that that's a school. Unless you kind of look and you see, the, you see the playground in the background, you may not know it's a school. So this gives us the ability to, to broadcast that a little bit more. Um, the Lander Grinspoon Academy on Prospect Street. Um, again, more, more numbers from 2009. Um, this was before the creation of the four-way stop that has been put in at Woodlawn and Jackson Street. Uh, the average speed uh, was, when average, the 85th percentile speed was 35 to 38 miles an hour. So a little bit fast. Um, and the speed limit there is 35. In addition to serving uh, that, that elementary school, a school zone on Prospect Street would also serve Jackson Street School, because you may have noticed that there's a crossing guard there. Uh, children cross at that location across Prospect Street on their, on their journey to Jackson Street School. Um, and so because it's going to help these individual schools themselves and because these, these zones will lie at crucial locations around the city, and this is like you know, defense contractors who build parts of different war machines in all, the diff in all different states, this is the same thing. This is built-in support because um, I think this, this affects almost every ward in the city. Um, that's how I know I'll have the votes for this issue, because it affects all of us. Um, 
it really, the, the, the locations where these school zones would be, I think, enhances our overall traffic calming effect, uh, uh, efforts in Northampton. And so I think, I think it's important we do all we can for the schools and also calm traffic in a reasonable and thoughtful way. Creating school zones in this way is a tool we can use to do that. And so I'd simply like to expand our school zones to the extent we can uh, as allowed by Mass General Law. And that's what this would do. Council Murphy and then Council Bars and then Council Plank. I just want to mention and, and that, um, that for people who question why we're not doing the high schools, that mm -hmm. state law says school zones exist from grade eight down, correct? Down to one. Yes. Yeah. So the high schools <coughs> do not qualify for school zones by state. Thank you. If yeah. I can expand on that yeah. as a, in a response just briefly. And it addresses all of the deletions that the council president read off in the beginning. Someone could also be forgiven for, for seeing that and, and asking what's the city council doing, deleting all these criteria. Well, the reality is that state law sets the criteria, not, not local ordinance. There's, a, a, there's pretty strict rules about where school zones can and cannot go. And the ordinance we had in the past and have today um, on the books really tried to duplicate state law in an imperfect way that it best creates confusion. So yeah, one of the main, you know, you can ask, you know, Beacon Hill what they're, what, if, you know, what they were thinking when they did this, but for some reason, you, you can only have a school zone between grades one and eight. So kindergarten doesn't count. Ridiculous. Schools, uh, uh, preschools don't count, and high schools right. don't count, so. Um, and there are other reasonable criteria as well. Actually, there is a chart uh, in the packet which has all the different rules and the authorities based on regulation and, and state law. Um, some are very reasonable. You know, you, if children don't have to cross the, the street uh, for whatever reason, there's no reason for a school zone um, and, and other reasonable things. But thank you, Councilor. That's an important thing to point out. So. Councilor Barge. That, I, I want to thank Councilor Murphy because I was very concerned about the high schools and Smith Folk. And I'm just wondering, Councilor O'Donnell, if there's any way that councilors could write a letter to the State House in regards of changing this law because I don't agree with that. No matter if it's a high school or not or Smith Volk, I think, why not put zoning? Um, lights at the areas of high schools or Smith Folk. I'm, I'm just very uncomfortable with that. Well, I, I, can, I can understand. Um, so, but is there some way as counselors that we could move on and attempt to try to do something to change it? Well, um, I agree that it should be changed. And I'll note that in a recent municipal modernization bill, um, new powers were given the cities and towns to, in certain, certain cases, set up, um, they call them safety zones. Um, in, in, in addition to the power actually to, in certain instances, lower the speed limit um, in, on unposted streets um, from the default 30. Like if you drive on a residential street and there's, and there's no posted speed limit, there is a speed limit, it's just not posted, it's 30. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we take advantage of this law, we could, we could decide to lower it to 25. Those are two issues that the Transportation and Parking Commission will be looking at in the near future. And there might be an intersection with, with some of your concerns, Councillor. So I would note that. But getting, getting Beacon Hill to do the other things we might want is anyone, anyone's guess is as good as mine how to make that. Happen. People do go to the State House. And if they would like to see changes, yeah. they are vocal about it. That's why I'm just wondering if that was a possibility. Thank yes, you. you're not precluded from doing that. You may do that. Uh, Councilor Klein was next, and then Councilor Bidwell, and then Councilor Nash. Um, thank you, Councilor O'Donnell. I think this is a really important uh, bill. And we saw it with um, JFK on Bridge Road for the longest time, didn't have school zone status, and that exactly. was changed um, a couple of years ago, and it allowed us to put in the flashing lights and a flashing beacon and all kinds of things that, is, that have really um, helped, I think, with safety for kids crossing the street. So thank you so much. Um, I'm just a little bit worried that we're not, we need to do a little bit more of an exhaustive um, look at what kinds of child serving programs we have in the city. If we're gonna do this now, we might as well include everything. I think there are 
are places that we're not even thinking about here, like Heck Academy on Pleasant Street, which serves kids um, in middle school and high school, but there are younger kids there. Um, the Clark School, did you mention the Clark School for the deaf? No, I didn't. It's only preschool there now. Um, I thought it goes up to like fifth grade or something. Used to. Oh, yeah. There are I, th now. Yeah. Oh, okay. There, there, okay. there's a program that's so I stand corrected on that one, but I just I think that it would be useful for us to maybe um, do a little bit more of a, um, a kind of survey environmental kind of scan mm -hmm. and just see if there are anything there's anything else. And I do wonder, just talking about preschool, you know, is is that are we not able to do something around that? Because if we do have Clark School for the Deaf and we have preschoolers and their parents mm -hmm. probably crossing um, State Street or um, other locations. So I, I just, I guess what I'm saying is I'd like to think a little bit more expansively, take a little bit more time maybe to see if there are other locations that we need to include in this list. I, I appreciate that. And in fact, this list was smaller when I first started it. And I tried to do some of that expansive thinking um, the Transportation and Parking Commission talked about this and kind of brainstormed the other locations that would meet the, the state warrants in coordination with our traffic engineer and chief of police and uh, uh, director of the Department of Public Works um, and some citizens from people I heard of. And I heard, you know, Councilor Nash just brought up the Heck Academy, for example. Um, I, wish, I wish we could do it. Uh, I wish we had more license to put this, to put these in places where perhaps we can't you know, I mean, I'm not sure one can go on Gothic Street for the People's Institute, for example. That's another one. You know, there are many preschools in the city that don't qualify. Um, so this list represents, to the best of my knowledge, the extent. If, we, if this ordinance were to pass, it in no way precludes additional school zones. Should we research it and find that, you know, if you found one that was missed and you determined that it meets the criteria, we would add it. Um, so my, my preference in appreciation for you know, what you're bringing up would be to pass this because it's an improvement. And then if we determine other ones, then I would even work with you if you want to incorporate that into the ordinance to make the council president read more numbers and figures. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. If that would be an acceptable. <coughs> if that would be okay. Is that okay? Um, I guess I would want to hear from other counselors as well because it seems to me if we're going to do something like this, um, it makes as much sense to kind of get a little bit more input from the city if there are other locations that are appropriate mm -hmm. um, before we pass it. I know that once okay. we have a bill before us, there is this impetus to kind of move it forward, but um, it just seems like we might as well do it right and it sounds like you've done a lot of research already and you've gotten input but I'm just wondering if there is a need to do a little bit more just because there are already a couple other places that are coming to mind. Councilor Bidwell, then uh, Councilor Nash, and then Councilor Shara. Um, I very much appreciate the work of Councilor O'Donnell and Transportation Parking on this because it, 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 is, it is a two for it. it, it, it addresses safety issues around <coughs> schools, but it also has citywide traffic calming effects. Um, so I, I, I and, and yes, it turns out that those situations that fit through the filter are scattered around the city. Um, so I, 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 I applaud it, and, and, and I frankly would be uh, supportive of, of proceeding with approval now, in part because I, I'm aware of how exhaustive the, the study has been, and I'm, I'm convinced uh, I, don't, I don't like the, uh, the the fact that the daycares are excluded from this, but uh, for example, or the high school. But I'm but I'm convinced that what what what's here is what you know is the result of a fair amount of uh, study of what what passes the test and what does not. Uh, so I'd be in favor of of, of, of moving it now, knowing that uh, there could be something added. I do d did though on the, on this. I, I'm I'm still bothered by this by the. By the, by the daycare issue uh, under un, or, or kindergarten under under grade one and I and I note and your reference here is very handy that um, most of the other provisions are a function of mass general law but that particular piece um, grades one through eight mm -hmm. uh, appears to come out of mass dot regulations 
Um, and I just wonder if there's a little more ability to push back. Mm. Um, and, and I just wonder if it's worth pursuing it a little bit, not mm -hmm. exhaustively. It may be that you push and you don't get no. anywhere. But mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I don't, I, don't, I don't buy the rationale of not including under, under age one. I suppose it's because, well, if you're under age one, you're going to have a parent, a guardian. You're going to have somebody escorting you. Well, I know, it's a long time ago, but I know if, if you're dragging your, your, your two-year-old across the street, that's not, you know, you're fully exposed to traffic as much as, the, you know. so I, I, don't, I don't buy the rationale. And I, and I, and I, and I, and, uh, I think it might be, I, I just soon see it pass now, but I'd like to just investigate whether there's some possibility w without going to legislature, just mm -hmm. going to the regulatory rule book at MassDOT. So I'll offer a response to that, just briefly? Sure. I completely agree. I think we're expanding it with this ordinance to the degree we can without getting a waiver from MassDOT. But we should certainly petition MassDOT in certain cases if we think it's uh, prudent. Mm -hmm. So I would be definitely in support of what you're saying, Councilor. Councilor Nash. With um, so <coughs> first off, I need to disclose I'm on the board of Cutchins. And, um, but what's going on here is merely a, a name change for the zone and that um, I think it's, I don't know. Is it I, okay? You do not have a conflict, you do not benefit financially and uh, okay. but I do appreciate your disclosure. Okay, that's the first thing. Um, second, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate the, the work that Councillor O'Donnell's done on this. This is, it's really terrific. It's, you know, for Ward 3 in particular, you know, three separate schools school zones are being addressed here. There are also streets that tend to be cut throughs during rush hour and to have this added um, signage and possibility of enforcement is really terrific. I mean Pomeroy Terrace, you know, w will get a lot of cut throughs. Uh, Bates Avenue, you know, that's the, the, the focal point of the trucks and, you know, and commuter cut throughs in, in the morning. So this is all terrific. Um, as far as um, it, the Heck Academy piece that, um, that uh, Councillor O'Donnell and I had, had talked about this, and the, the issue there is the seventh and eighth graders, and that uh, we, we plan to talk to Heck a little further about there to clarify that. And, and if it works, we can consider adding that in later. Mm -hmm. But that was, it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't entirely clear that they have seventh and eighth graders all the time. So. Um, and so I, I'd be in favor of, of putting this forward as it is uh, with the idea that, you know, like lots of things, we add more stuff to it later. Councilor Shara. Um, I too want to thank you. Um, as I think Ward 4 probably maybe benefits the most or the children of Ward 4 maybe do so. Um, Thank you for all the work, and, and actually, I think you're being, you've been maybe a bit modest as to the amount of work that you put into this. Um, and to, to Councillor Klein, maybe to make you feel a little bit better about this, I can. Councillor O'Donnell and I have had many conversations about this, and, and I'll just say for myself, I actually did quite a bit of research to try and make sure that we were covering um, all the schools possible. And heck, I think is the only one that's sort of come up on the radar that wasn't discussed. Um, so I fully agree that you know I, I wish we could expand this all the way through all possible education. But um, I think right now it, it's an amazing additions that, that have been uh, done here and, and really benefit all the kids. So thank you. Council Murphy, uh, because he has not spoken yet, and then Council LaVar. I'd also like to thank Transportation and Parking for the yeoman work on this. I would encourage us to pass this ordinance tonight because it creates a vast improvement over the status quo. But I encourage transportation and parking to continue to hunt up institutions that qualify, and then we can add them as we go along. But let's take the big plunge now and get things this major improvement in place. And then, if more more institutions qualify, we just add them to the list. But let's let's do this tonight and, and get things moving in the right direction. Council Lubart. Yes, um, I want to thank um, Councilor Ryan O'Donnell, also Councilor Gino. Sierra and transportation and parking. I am very, very pleased with this, and this is a tremendous amount of work, and both of you is doing research and so forth like that. 
I mean, it doesn't affect Marion Road School because when I had talked with Councilor Ryan this morning, way back when I became a counselor and our principal, Mr. Crother, had a very hard time getting a zoning light placed, a school light placed at Ryan Road School and within seven months of being as a counselor, I went right after it and it's there. And we also have a crosswalk there too, which I talked to you about, which we're having terrible speeding problems. And we have a crosswalk there with a cross guard. So I am very, very pleased with what you're doing to try to keep our children safe. And I have to say that I wish even the high schools and Smith Volk also were protected with something like this, no matter what your age is. Just like seatbelts and buses, that's another thing. Thank you for all your work. Thank you, Councilor. Anyone else? Okay. So, as amended, uh, roll call, please. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Uh, that passes in first reading, and we'll revisit that in our next meeting, our first meeting in April. So, uh, we've been asked to remove item 17.250. That's the ordinance to add a new smart overlay district while uh, Carlin Mish is in consultation with the state authorities. To continue. I'm just removing it from you, the you haven't put yeah. it on the floor. So. Yeah, it's not on the floor. So next up, we have item 17.2.51. This is an ordinance to remove the residential incentive overlay from the map, uh, the zoning map 350-3.4. And this is the first reading. And this is an ordinance. Hang on, here it comes. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of the mayor and the Office of Planning and Sustainability. Um, an ordinance to remove the residential incentive overlay from the zoning map, um, zoning map 350-3.4. An ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the Code of Ordinance City of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended by removing the RI overlay from the, uh, <laughs> once again, from the map in 350-3.4 of said code to be consistent with the text changes uh, made to eliminate this overlay. And the ordinance, uh, let's see, I'm just saying, with, it, it has, it, those of you who have, can you, well, it's a different map than what we've got, it, okay, yeah. but that's, okay, but that's the incentive overlay from uh, the zoning map, that's the said zoning map 350-3.4. Carolyn Mish is here uh, to speak to this, if I'll accept a motion to recognize, it. okay. All those in favor of recognizing Carolyn Mish, please say aye. Aye. Carolyn, would you like to come and speak to this? Sure. Thank you. Um, so the map that's shown there in the yellow outline is um, what we refer to as an overlay on top of um, the base zoning districts. And it covers, um, I believe there are three underlying zoning districts that this um, currently this graphic overlay. So um, we, so about um, 25 to maybe 27 years ago, the city adopted an ordinance um, for, to apply this overlay district in, at the time in which we had excess capacity in the sewer lines and also there wasn't quite as much um, traffic um, issue on Route 9, Bridge Road, and out North King Street. So that swath is really the northern edge at the lake that you see up there, that's Fitzgerald Lake. So the southern boundary is basically Bridge Road and Route 9. Um, no, uh, so the incentive was to create, to allow people who are developing over um, uh, large parcels of four or more acres um, to develop in a cluster arrangement whereby you would um, focus your unit development in one par portion of the parcel and, and permanently protect the rest of the property. 
Um, we do still have cluster allowances, but this incentive uh, was to inc um, encourage affordable housing. So if you allocated 30% of the units that you're building to permanently protected affordable housing, you could potentially get more units overall to help sort of um, subsidize, uh, be subsidized by the market rate units. No project <coughs> ever built under this incentive over the 27 year history or so. Um, and we've now um, realized that the capacity issues are different than they were um, uh, back at the time and also the plans for uh, development have change in the sustainable uh, Northampton plan is not necessarily targeting either um, higher density housing or affordable housing in this portion of the city. So two years ago, a year and a half ago, when the zoning district, the underlying zoning districts for the uh, um, suburban residential and rural residential, which are located in this area, um, were changed, the, there was the reference and the allowance for residential incentive was eliminated. But at the time, we didn't remove the map element. So on our zoning map, that sh still shows the swath here, even though the text doesn't allow you to proceed in um, with application for a project that would be a cluster development with affordable housing. So this is um, essentially getting rid of the map so that it's um, eliminates the confusion and misunderstanding about what the map relates to. So that's the uh, Before detail. we have any questions, I'd actually ask for a motion to put this on the floor. Second. No, no, we only recognize Carolyn. But now we're good. Uh, all those in favor of putting this on the floor, let's see. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, any questions? That's all now. Um, was, it, was Pines Edge Drive? built under this or is that not it really wasn't it was actually a 40b project which uh, is under state another defined statutory allowance okay. uh, provision yeah there was a proposed project that actually conformed to this that got defeated that's right there was oh, one proposal but no, no projects ever came to fruition right. yeah council did well uh, I, I'm just curious not that it uh, sounds like it ever came up but where there is a conflict between the map and the text which which prevails um, if it should ever come up the text I mean so if you if there's the table of use uh, identifies all the uses allowed in a certain district and the way our zoning works is if it's not um, specifically enabled or allowed in the text then it's not allowed um, as a use okay well just so basically the um, the incentive overlay map refers to an overlay allow that that doesn't exist anymore right. that so right okay it's it's cleaning up the zoning you know we're as we're going through and making changes overall I mean it's taken years to to implement portions of the sustainable Northampton right. plan so we do this section by section and so um, at the time I think you know it just fell off the radar oh there's a map out there just. Well, okay. in, this is the thing that struck me when I was reading this is why why doesn't the map naturally follow I think that since the map refer, refers to the law because I don't remember voting on the map we always vote on the law we don't necessarily vote on on maps per se as separate items so so it is it's interesting so w there's a there are a lot of text changes but the zone the boundary of a zone um, doesn't necessarily change with it, all the text changes so if you're going to make an ex and typically we do it oh, most of the time it's done simultaneously so if we're doing let's say the most recent um, boundary change we've made has been to the central business district so if we're changing urban residential c to central business with a little expansion we simultaneously put 3.4 in there and say oh yeah we got to change the map That's too the package. yeah okay. um we've heard the term constructive criticism I want to pioneer constructive confusion um, because I have kind of a question about some of the some of the language. I brought some of it up at legislative matters, um, and I still have some um, some of that confusion, which I kind of want to offer sort of respectfully and in, um, in the process of, of this debate. Um, 
one on the merits of it, if I know the position of the planning department is that the residential incentive um, overlay is just is, is no more, but if it if it did exist, um, I wouldn't have a problem with it being on the books, even if in fact it was seldom or never used, just because it's optional. Um, it was originally part of a special permit process, it, right? And the planning board had the discretion to to use it or not. In other words, it doesn't chill development because developers aren't required to do it. It's not an inclusionary zoning law or something like that. It's just a a tool that could have been used, and it turns out the market didn't support it, and the infrastructure wasn't what you thought, so it wasn't really used. Um, so my, on the, on the substance of it, if I had my way, you know, if, if this could just still exist, I would be fine with it. So my question is about kind of what is a, an overlay district um, at a basic level, because I, I, I read the zoning chapter in our code, and I see um, lots of references to overlaid zoning districts, including, including this one. Um, you know, for example, there's an existing section, 10.11, which is the residential incentive development overlay district, and it describes what it is, and you just described it as well. Uh, a minimum of 33 units have to be affordable, and then you can increase density and that kind of thing. And then there's a section, 3.3, which just as overlay zoning districts. And it's, it's brief, it says, an education use district, floodplain district, water supply protection district, and residential incentive development districts are superimposed over other districts shown on the zoning map as recognition of the special conditions which exist in those areas. And when there are conflicts, the regulations for the overlay district supersede uh, the underlying district. So my, it, as I read it, and I'm, I, I realize that, as I said during Legislative Matters, um, everyone on the planning board has more, and you, have, has more knowledge of zoning in your, in your little toe than, than I do. But as I read this, it, I, I wonder if, in fact, this, is, this could still be said to be um, in place, even though it's not in the table of, of, of use and, and dimension for the rural residential area. It just seems strange that we have these other references that support and define what an overlay district is and what specifically the, the, the residential incentive overlay district is. And I wonder if those would have to be deleted as well to complete the removal. Um, and that's kind of a question that I, is on my mind. Yes, I mean, we will um, take those references when, as I mentioned in Legislative Matters, uh -huh. um, uh, there is a draft that's been reviewed by the planning board. It's been, um, actually, it's, it's gone through many years of um, changes <laughs> for restructuring the entire cluster provision. Right. And so at that time, um, the idea was we take that whole cluster section that talks about um, how you do a cluster and put it forward at once. Mm -hmm. But you're, there are pieces that are still there. Mm -hmm. Um, that will need to be addressed eventually. Um, there are other aspects of the zoning that are placed in there that are sort of placeholders for potentially sort of where we think we'd want to go as a community, mm -hmm. and they're not in effect because they're not in the table of use, but they're elsewhere in the zoning. So we have administrative review. Um, we have even in the fee section of our code, we have, mm -hmm. or, um, um, in our office, we have fees set up for administrative review. We don't do staff level reviews of site plans um, really yet, but we are moving in that direction or hope to move in that direction. So mm -hmm. there are other places, and we have the Farms, Forests, and Rivers um, designation in the code that talks about if a private developer wants to come and build under Farms, Forests, and River, but we mm -hmm. don't have that provision spelled out throughout and sort of completing that package. So yes, we do still need to remove um, uh -huh. the, um, a piece of that at, even after this map is taken off. Uh -huh. But um, because the map is um, you know, out there, people are looking at it, they see an overlay of a different color or different hatching, um, questions arise periodically about what that means. And since we don't have the provision in there anymore, um, we thought it was appropriate to remove the map because we 
frankly, it fell off the radar when we were taking it out of the other two tables. Well, I don't, I don't want to belabor the point. I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate all the, all the work you've done, not just in this part of zoning, but I mean, this is such a complex subject in your office, and you handle it so expertly. Um, but I mean, if, if you look at the, the other overlay district, which we're not taking up, so I won't discuss it substantively, but the one that's essentially for the, the affordable housing development on, on Bridge Street, which is separate, it's, it's, a, it's, the, uh, it's the 40R. Okay. Um, what is that, that building is, what's the underlying zoning district for that building? Is it URC? Urban Residential C, yep. So does Urban Residential C contain in the, in the table of use and dimension a reference to that overlay district, thereby empowering us to put the overlay district on it? Um, so in the text, so when there will be a map change mm -hmm. and then um, in the planned, um, there's not a reference in the table of use mm -hmm. um, to the 40R overlay. Okay. Um, and I can confirm with the state whether they, because it's a special it's legislation, special. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, it has different parameters. Uh -huh. I don't know if, and specifically they're calling, the odd thing is they say it's not zoning even though they refer to it as an overlay district. Mm. Um, so it's almost, they, the state looks at it as a different type of regulatory mechanism. Interesting. Um, okay. So that may be where the, the, the difference is. Yeah. Um, because the way it's 40R is set up is you create exactly a geographic area over which okay. it's laid. And so I, would, I think it's a different animal. I, can, I see where you're going with that, but yeah. I think that oh, I see what you're saying too, yeah. Created completely separately under a separate statutory okay. authority. Well, well thank you. I'll leave, I'll leave it there. I just want to kind of explain. I kind of want to look at this. I may support on second reading. I, I do want to be cautious because actually if I had my way, you know, when, when the rural residential underlying district was changed. I didn't really contemplate this as, as th that change uh, creating this removal too. And I don't really have a problem with this district. And if I had my way, I would just keep it as a tool the planning board could use. So I'm cautious about, about that. But I, you know, again, what the, our senior land use planner is saying um, makes sense as well. So I just want to look at this and explain my position tonight, which is probably not gonna support it, but I wanna answer these questions and I may support it on second reading. Just to explain my position. So. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Uh, just to, to follow up on what Councillor O'Donnell was asking about. So the table of use. So an overlay should be referenced in the table of use. Otherwise, it's not empowered. So that's kind of what's going on here. It's not in a, in a table of use, and that we are considering other overlays. You know, for for URC does. Do we need to? In yeah, so let me just clarify that a little bit. So the way that it was established and the way it was originally created, um, there, was, there were specific use and dimensional allowances in the table of use and the table of dimensions in the rural residential area and the suburban residential area. It clearly said if you're building in a rural in um, incentive, residential incentive overlay, here's what you can do, here are the uses allowed, and here are the dimensions. And it was right there in the table. We, we extracted that out of the table of use. Um, 40R is a little bit of a different animal because the state doesn't want, the state has created it as a separate, um, separate from zoning, which is um, under a different, uh, Mass General Law designation. So they still call it an overlay and they, they, over, they tell you to overlay it on top of other zoning, but it's this special thing. So it, it's, um, <laughs> and it was created more recently, 2006 or seven is when the state legislature created this thing and zoning was created back in the 70s. So um, I haven't looked at that um, in that particular question, but my offhand um, uh, response to it is that I don't. I think because the state set up 40R in a different way, and they wanted to want you to think of it differently from zoning, that it doesn't necessarily need to have that same reference back in the zoning because they want to 
they want it to be separate and on top of. And in fact, part of the feedback that we're getting from 40R, I know this isn't on the table, but just to sort of take it one more step, is that they don't want in the 40R text they don't want any references to any other piece of your zoning or any other regulation. They want everything carried over and copied over so it's distinct within 40R. Um, and that's I think, gets to that because they want it as a nice, neat, separate package, even though they, it's all related to land use. <laughs> um, and so that's one of the things that's going to take a little bit longer for us to get through is make sure that we've dropped all references to other pieces of the zoning. If we want to reference that, we actually, instead of referencing it, we have to copy and paste it into this so it's a standalone thing. Thanks. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Just briefly before we vote, um, for anyone who's, who's watching, we were discussing two different zoning overlays. I just want to make sure people know which one we're talking about. I allowed, I allowed the discussion of a referral. Uh, and, and it's fine. Continue. The explanation would help because it's technically on the agenda. We're just not we're choosing yeah. not to talk yeah. about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Th th this is not the overlay that would be required to expand affordable housing on Bridge Street, which I support. This is a separate, older overlay district that actually encourages affordable housing um, in a different part of the city. And I just want to be cautious about eliminating it because I think every tool that we have to support affordable housing is important too. To maintain, so just want to delineate the two for anyone who's listening. Um, there's a difference between the two, so thank you. And I know for a lot of folks, we may have wandered into the weeds or what it sounded like the weeds, but essentially, as as Carol is describing, we have state enabling language that is creating a different creature or a different form of uh, land use regulation, not called zoning. Um, and as such, they're, the criteria for qualification are different. And, uh, and, and what you're hearing the two counselors here talk about are also the criteria by which we do apply uh, regulation and management under zoning. So I don't think I cleared up a damn thing. <laughs> 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 so uh, anyway, any further discussion? Councilor Bidwell. Having nothing to do with Bridge Street and 40R, but only with what's actually on our. As I understand it, Councilor O'Donnell, if 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 you wanted to keep this on the map, it still wouldn't matter because it's it, it it's already been removed. It's been removed in the text. So to, to, to keep to keep the map would not allow someone to come on come, come along and use that that, the, 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 that that overlay. It doesn't exist. It's just that we never got around to catching up with the map. So I don't think that keeping it on the map would keep the ability of anyone to use what at one time was an overlay district but is no longer, if I'm understanding it right. Go to respond. Yeah. No, and that is the essential premise that I guess I'm questioning, respectfully questioning, because it seems to me that if an overlay district exists on a map, which is part of the ordinance, and we have parts of the code that say if you have an overlay district, the rules of the overlay district, which are defined in the ordinance, will apply to the underlying districts. It seems to me that perhaps, you know, I'm willing to be, I'm willing to embarrass myself and be wrong about it, you know, <laughs> because I am. I'm, I'm certainly not anywhere near the expertise of the planning department, but as I read it, that's what I question. I question whether that's true. And I'm willing to accept that I may be wrong, but. I just want to do my due diligence and check because I want to be cautious. And but you're, you identify the issue exactly. Yeah, so. and, and to your point, that given the fact that the uh, planning board is a discretionary board, it, uh, I, I think by your suggestion that at least this gives a provision of a hint of, uh, uh, of even though it's an artifact, but it, it gives a, a, a hint of the desire to to facilitate the expansion or development of affordable housing. Councilor Murphy, did you have something you want to say? <laughs> okay. Nice. Councilor Sharon. So since we're talking about the hint, can I just so Carolyn, but back to sort of maybe the initial reason that it was that it was removed, the language was removed. There's not the infrastructure to support the housing, is that correct? 
Right, we feel it's challenged now for that. There's the, this both uh, um, from a traffic standpoint and sewer capacity issue, and frankly, from where we want to encourage affordable housing to be built. Um, there's not, um, this is not the area where we, from a policy perspective, would want to encourage that. And so um, that's the initial reasoning behind taking it out of the table when it was, and when the tables were changed. Um, and, you know, if you all feel it's cleaner to just come back with an extraction of all the references to, I mean, I'd be happy to do that. Um, but the idea was to make sure that, um, you know, ultimately that that provision was taken out, um, not because um, no one had ever used it, but because it's no longer an area from a policy perspective that um, is good to support extra density for that purposes or where we'd want to encourage affordable housing. It's not necessarily accessible by transit depending on where you're located there. There's not a lot of, um, there are other resource constraints there. Um, and uh, so for those reasons, um, and that there are other places in the city that make more sense to encourage both the densities and the type of units, a mix of market rate and affordable. I mean, as I, as I said in community resources when we first talked about this, um, you know, I too would never want to discourage affordable housing, um, but I'm also, I'm, I'm hesitant about planting Easter eggs for something that's not uh, feasible or would, would work for uh, someone who brought forth a proposal. Any other discussion? Okay, roll call please. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. No. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. All right, that passes in first reading. We'll revisit that now first. <clears throat> Uh, last item on the agenda, item 17.252. This is an ordinance to clarify the definition of structure for compliance with setbacks in uh, Chapter 350-2.1 of the said code. And this is the first reading. And this is, um, hang on a sec. This is upon the recommendation of the Mayor and the Office of Planning and Sustainability. This is to clarify the definition of structure for compliance with setbacks of said code. An ordinance of the city of uh, providing the code of ordinance, blah, blah, blah. The ordinance, uh, the structure, structure, a combination of materials for permanent or temporary occupancy of use, such as a building, yeah. bridge trestle, tower, framework, retaining wall, now supporting more than four feet of unbalanced fill, tank, tunnel, tent, solar panel, wind turbine, stadium, reviewing stand, platform when more than uh, one foot above grade, swimming pool, permanently a fixed place structure, shelter, pier, storage, container, sign, gas line pump, gasoline, uh, gasoline pump, uh, recreational court, or the like. Uh, there were some deletions. One of them was wharves, uh, bin, fences. Uh, yes, and that's it, I believe. Uh, Carolyn's here to uh, and she's still recognized. Carol, if you want to speak to this. Um, sure. <laughs> Generally, um, basically, we um, this is um, a review with the building commissioner about trying to clarify the definition of structure to be consistent with the um, um, interpretation that has um, been used um, for many years. And just make it, I guess, more user friendly, easier to understand, and then also reevaluate some of the things that maybe aren't so appropriate because we went into that section and we saw that, you know, wharves probably aren't so necessary for us to have. Um, so there were, it did come up um, in legislative matters. There's a bit of discussion about um, um, tents and um, what does that mean and why is it in there. That was not a term that was added in this iteration, but it's sort of been in there for a while to count that as a structure. And this is in the zoning code, so it's really about saying, um, 
determining what's a structure for um, zoning regulations, mostly as it relates to um, setbacks in the different districts. So if someone has a proposal to put something in their a patio, for example, on their property, um, it's not falling under the definition of structure, so it doesn't. It can go right up to this to the property lines. There isn't a restriction because it's not counted as a structure. Um, so going back to the issue of um, tents, there's quite a bit of discussion, and I think the folks on legislative matters can also sort of throw their comments in about this. But in the interim, um, there's a there was a request to, for um, me to find out more specificity from the building commissioner about how the tent might be defined, could it be by time or by size. And so um, that the change you have now is since it was originally introduced that there was a quali qualification that um, perhaps you could incorporate um, tents except those that are less than 120 square feet and erected less um, for less than 30 days. So the 120 square feet is really um, a size tent that the building commissioner really wants to review for stability. If someone's putting a large tent on their property, even if it's temporarily, you want to make sure it's tied down so that all the people that are gathering underneath aren't harmed. Um, there's also uh, issues about flammability and that kind of thing. So that's sort of the 120 square foot threshold. It doesn't necessarily require a full building permit that larger structures need. 400 square foot tents, I guess, is the is a, the next step up. Um, and then, of course, it's not intended to address, you know, pup tents that you throw up in your yard for a night or, you know, just hanging out in your backyard. So um, hopefully that clarifies it for counselors and that you feel comfortable about that. And then the other change that came from Legislative Matters was um, instead of specifically identifying gasoline pumps that maybe it could be more broadly defined as fuel pumps. the one that was on the agenda that was posted Monday during the day. So it did not include any of those changes that were discussed in legislative matters. Yeah. So so the, the council will need to amend. amend. Thank and that, you. And that would be the except those, uh, and that would be under tents, except those less than 120 feet and erected for less than 30 days. Solar panels. Right, and then everything else is the same. Right? And gas changed and the fuel pump, the gas and the fuel pump. So I would yeah. move the amendments Thank you. from legislative matters. Second. Second. All those in favor of the amendments, please say aye. 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 Okay. So back back to the order as amended. Um, and do we have a motion to put this on the floor? No. No. Okay. Can I have a motion to put? I move it as amended. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, further discussion on this item. Councilor Nash. So, um, Ms. Mish and I, we've had some emails back and forth around um, it, it, some of the language, some of the existing language, and that um, because of legislative matters, we were looking at what the additions are, were and what was going out, and um, since then I've been, you know, looking at uh, things around shelters and swimming pools, and you know, and I've been thinking about, you know, and and we've had some back and forth, you know, that. So you can have a shed within four feet of your property line um, in, in mo for most properties. And, uh, but that uh, the way that most people install them, they'll put them right up against the, the fence. You know, that they're, they're um, and, and also I, I can think of numerous places where, you know, neighbors have sheds within that setback swimming pools you know the the above ground pools and i wonder if you know we might want to explore you know that we have some exceptions for those types of installation um that um for example so an above ground pool right now if it's in urc would need to be 10 feet back from either side property line and then 20 feet back from the rear property line well if urc you know we're talking some of the smaller properties in town 
and you have a very small backyard, you're putting it, if you can fit it in, that pool's fitting right out your back door. It, whereas, ideally, maybe it's more off to the, to the side. You, you can figure out better ways to utilize your yard. The same thing with, um, uh, you know, your garden shed and, and probably some other structures if we thought about it. But those were the two big ones that stood out for me. Um, I don't want to out my neighbors who I know are out of compliance right now, but I think if you, if, if you go home, you, you might be one of those people. <laughs> and that, um, uh, you know, I'm just wary of us pushing forward something. Um, I'm, we've actually already done it. The, the language is already in here. Uh, but I, perhaps it's something we should recommend that uh, gets looked at. Uh, in terms of if we're if we're encouraging um, uh, the, you know infill s more dense use of properties, we need to come up with a better way for people to use the the property that they have, and um, and getting it into their setbacks to you to to utilize them as part of that. So, Council of the Barge, Council of Bidwell. Carolyn, um, I talked with Kyle today in regards to my concerns about the tents. Uh -huh. And he said that he has not received any complaints, any complaints. He did not know about Louie, and I was going to get back with them tomorrow anyways because I know we're having two readings. And he said the only complaint that he had dealt with was at the – the fairgrounds, and that was cooking in the tents. And I know in legislative matters, you had brought forth in regards about how this came about with the tents from the building inspector's department in regards to concern. So I wanted to talk with, with him about that, and he said, there is not an issue, he said, at all about campus tents in people's backyards. And I said, well, we're talking about setbacks and so forth like that. And I also asked him about when do you have to have a permit for a tent? He says, you don't need, he said, a permit for a canvas tent, depending not unless it's one of those big, huge, large ones. And I said, well, what about if you have a party at your home and you have, and you say from Taylor until wherever, and you have a big tent brought in, you have to take it down within three days? He said he knew nothing about that. Yeah, so um, as, as was discussed, tent has been on there for I don't know how long. There's exactly. No, so, um, the, what I think I mentioned during the, the meeting was that um, there was no, there was, um, the building commissioner didn't want to remove the term tent from the definition of structures because we'd still want to look at that and, in, and then that's when the conversation came up about, well, is there a way to quantify it in a more specific way so that there are certain tents that are no problem. So that's where the 120 square feet of tent, which is the larger kind, which in fact the building commissioner indicated to me that they do want to look at those because of the safety concern of uh, making sure it's installed properly so it doesn't harm people who are gathering underneath it. If there's a fire, you know, the fabric, the type of tent, if there's an issue. At 120 feet? 120 square feet. And then if it's up for more than 30 days, you'd want to um, quanti qualify that as a structure for purposes of setback. And then to clarify, structures, this covers all types of structures, principal and accessory structures. So principal structures in a residential district are houses, apartment buildings, or mixed-use business buildings. Accessory structures are, you can imagine, sheds, pools, um, you know, um, storage areas, workshops, um, things of that sort. So accessory structures have different setbacks than principal structures. Principal structures have the standard, you know, you, if you're in a 24-7 living arrangement, your setback is going to be greater than accessory structure, which is not intended for permanent occupancy of people. So pools and tents and 
um, sheds um, in the in-town urban districts can be four feet from the property line, side and rear. Principal structures can, can be 10 to 15 or should be 10 to 15 or 20 in the rear. So they're treated differently. Um, so the issue um, about the tents is really sort of the timing issue. If it's up for a long time and people, there's constant occupancy or use of that, it's, um, it should be considered more of probably an accessory structure in that case. So then it would meet the smaller setback as opposed to the principal structure setback. Right, like Kyle said to me, there's many, many um, covered campuses throughout the city and people park their cars in them or their trucks. Right, and that whatever. would be considered an accessory structure. It still needs to meet the setback um, for accessory structures, which is different from a setback. I understand that. Yes. But my concern was the size of a canvas tent using with something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Councilor Bidwell. So all this applies only in the context of setbacks. Exactly. Setbacks. Setbacks. Right. So it doesn't it, so it, it doesn't trigger it doesn't determine whether a building permit is triggered. Right. For example, if, if that's what you're asking. I'm I'm I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that a, a, a ten by twelve foot tent is not very big. No, it's not. And <laughs> setback setback issues aside, does a tent of that size trigger any any type of approval process? Um, so, um, anything over that, I think if it's going to be sort of this, a party tent, the bill, I'm not sure it would be referred to as a building permit, but there'd be some check the building department would like to evaluate, and I don't know what that, I don't know if you really have to go to a full-blown permit, but if it's over 120 square feet, then it would trigger a, at least a zoning review to say, okay, this is a structure, show us where you're going to put it on your property, and at that point, if it's going to be a weekend event thing, um, just like for the fairgrounds, when all those tents go up, the building department goes out and checks to make sure they're installed safely. So it would trigger a zoning permit review, but anything less than that wouldn't. Councilor Murphy. Um, and again, there was just tent in there for years. Uh, legislative matters, our, our desire was to have them quantify a number where people could feel if it's a smaller tent I don't have to worry about it <laughs> before any tent fell under the ordinance now we're saying if it's they're saying if it's under 120 feet square feet we don't need to worry about it and well, so or it would be left up to interpretation of the of yeah the building that, that it's not a structure you know and this is a kid's tent you know we're yeah, you're okay go there <laughs> because it wasn't there was no quantification right. any tent theoretically was a structure now we're saying the small ones, don't worry about it. That was the intent. Uh, <laughs> Council Chair, do you have your hand up? No. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't want to go there. Council Nash. So, all right, I, I think I'm getting this now. All right, so we got a lot of structures here. Some of them are principal structures and some of them are accessory structures and they'll be subject to different setbacks. Okay, so I was under the impression that, oh, these are all going to be subject to the setbacks, that they can't be built in setbacks, but it, all right. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Can I ask you about um, what I presume is boiler, boilerplate language, but uh, the administrative assistant and I are curious yeah. about the, uh, the term permanent or temporary occupancy. I mean, I don't, people are not occupying railroad trestles or um, wind turbines or solar panels. Is occupancy of use, is, is that just a fancy way of saying use or structure or is this just another artifact of? Because what it, I think what it feels like is jamming in, it's, it's jamming in a lot of stuff to try and fit with this phrase that doesn't necessarily. And that's why we have a building commissioner. And that's why we have a building commissioner to let There's him. interpretation, and they have wide range of saying, yep, you're not living here because trains are coming across every yes, you can't live in this. You can't live in this retaining wall because two things cannot occupy the same space at the same time. 
get out of that turbine. Okay, uh, no big thing, but maybe for future reference, it might be a language change that would just make it a little simpler. And, yeah. <laughs> Any other discussion? Council of Art. Council President, um, is there any way that we could have that um, change to the def definition of structure, please email to us? I don't have it. Uh, I think we received that I in sent your email to today. Yes, you, you have an email that came yes, today from Pam with uh, the amended language. Um, we'll see that you get a second copy. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. That was fun. Um, roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Uh, Councilor Nash. Yes. That passes in first reading. We did that in our first meeting in April, and you don't have to come unless you really want to. <laughs> 40 R, yes, yes, yes. Exactly. 40 R, absolutely, all right. Uh, there are no other items pending. Um, uh, I think I've done an inventory. Who, who's coming to, who will be marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade uh, representing Northampton City Government? You and your brother. Come on, get it up. All right, all right, lads, there it is, okay. Um, no new business, no information requests. I'll accept a motion to move Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you all very much.